Hi, everybody. Welcome to our March Word for Word event. We could not be more excited about tonight's subject, editors and editing, and our three superstar panelists. My name is Paul Wickover, and I'm the Associate Dean of the Online MFA here at Southern New Hampshire University. I'm here with Jacob Powers, Associate Dean of the Online BA and MA Creative Writing Programs. Before we introduce our three distinguished panelists, I have some important housekeeping items to share. And the first I've kind of already told you off camera, which is that you're on candid camera. This is being recorded tonight, so the microphones and cameras are disabled. Uh, and if you don't want to appear in the recording, just don't type in the chat. But if you don't mind, we would love for you to type in the chat because that's where we, we will be surfacing questions from to our guests. Um, so uh, at this point, I'm going to just pass it over to uh, Jacob so that he can introduce our panelists. All right. Thank you so much, Paul. Um, yes, and welcome everyone to tonight's Word for Word event. So our guests uh, tonight are two editors and one copy editor each at the apex of their respective professions. So thank you all for sharing your wisdom and experience with us tonight. Um, before I go any further, I'm going to go ahead and, and read their bios. Um, Ellen Datlow has been editing speculative short fiction for over four decades. She was fiction editor of Omni Magazine for 17 years, then editor of Sci Fiction, the fiction arm of the Sci-Fi Channel's website for six years. She currently acquires short stories and novellas for Tor.com and is horror imprint Nightfire. She has edited numerous anthologies for adults, young adults, and children, including the Best Horror of the Year annual series, When Things Get Dark, stories inspired by Shirley Jackson, Body Shocks, Extreme Tales of Body Horror, Screams from the Dark, 19 Tales of Monsters in the Monstrous, and Christmas and Other Horrors. She's won multiple Locus, Hugo, Stoker, International Horror Guild, Shirley Jackson, and World Fantasy Awards, plus the Splatterpunk Award, and in 2020, uh, 2012, received the uh, Il Postro Nero Black Spot Award for Excellence as Best Foreign Editor. Datlow was named recipient of the 2007 Carl Edward Wagner Award given at the British Fantasy Convention for outstanding contribution to the genre and was honored with the Life Achievement Award given by the Horror Writers Association in acknowledgement of superior achievement over an entire career. She was also honored with the World Fantasy Life Achievement Award at the 2014 World Fantasy Convention and the Shirley Jackson Awards Incorporated recently presented her with a special award in recognition of the anthology When Things Get Dark, Stories Inspired by Shirley Jackson, which was published by Titan Books in 2021. Ellen runs the Fantastic Fiction at KGB Reading Series in the East Village, New York City with Matt, Matthew Kressel. She can be found on the website datlow.com and on X and on Facebook. So welcome, Ellen. Hi. And thank you. And I'll, I'll hop right in so we can get through and then we'll we'll jump right into the question. So and then my next uh, guest is Deanna Hoke. Um, she's a freelance copy editor specializing in fantasy and science fiction. She's the only copy editor ever shortlisted for a World Fantasy Award. Uh, Deanna has been publishing in or publishing for over 30 years and holds a BA and MA in English with concentrations in composition, linguistics, respectively. And has copy edited books ranging from young adult to complex four color college textbooks with massive art and photo logs. She has worked in almost every genre. Speculative novels she has copy edited have been finalists for and have sometimes won the Hugo, Nebula, Arthur C. Clarke, Endeavor, Golden Spur, Locus, Philip K. Dick, John W. Campbell Memorial, British Science Fiction, British Fantasy, and World Fantasy Awards. So welcome, Deanna. Thank you. And finally, we have Joe Monty, who is the Hugo and World Fantasy Award nominated editor and founder of Saga Press, an imprint of Simon & Schuster. He has worked as an agent and as a book buyer, and his clients as an agent and authors as a publisher have been awarded the National Book Award, the Michael L. Prince Award, the Alex Award, the Bram Stoker Award, the Hugo Award, the Lambda Literary Award, the Locus Award, the Nebula <laughs> Award, the Shirley Jackson Award, and the World Fantasy Award. Welcome, Joe. Hey, <laughs> so yeah, I can see. I mean, uh, here's my first, anyone here's who can my get, first like, question. Can find the threads I, of what, what everyone yeah. won or has been part of. <laughs> that's that's my first question is, do you ever yeah. get tired of winning all these awards? Yeah, right. <laughs> no, <laughs> really ask no. no, there's really uh, worrying that you're not going to be nominated again, which happens, you know. Well, I, I mean, I haven't even been up for 
a Hugo in the last two or three years, I haven't been nominated, and that hurts. You know? <laughs> yeah, I feel your pain. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I am, I'm very impressed. I, I just like, I, I am winded just reading your bios. So <laughs> hopefully I have some steam left in me to ask the first question, which I think a lot of us are, are, are probably interested in is, is first of all, how, how you started about this business, like your journey into the publishing industry and how you ended up where you are today. You know, what you do as inspiring editors and copy editors to create these careers that you've created. And like Paul said, how the heck do you get all these awards? <laughs> <laughs> so let's start with Joe. Uh, I am co-opting a phrase that some another editor used. Uh, I'm a feral editor. Um, I started as a book seller and I rose up. Uh, this is in B. Dalton, if you re anybody remembers those, uh, which got co-opted by Barnes & Noble. And then I ran a couple of stores in outside of New York and then in the city. And then I became a assistant for 13 months and six days to one of their VPs. And then, uh, and then from there, I became a buyer. I bought uh, children's books. I bought, mostly I ended up concentrating on middle grade and YA. So I was at the right place at the right time um, during Harry Potter and the rise of YA. If you go to a Barnes and Noble and you see that the teen section is in between science fiction and romance and mystery, that's because of me. Um, from there, I went to Houghton for a year and a half as a means to an end to be a sales rep, um, just again to the publishing side of things. And then from there, I went to Little Brown Books for Young Readers for a year and a day. Um, politics. And then from there, I was a literary agent for four and a half years. Hi, Tiffany. Uh, and um, from there, I got my, I, as an agent, I got my dream job at Simon Schuster. I got the Califan on the arm because this is what I always wanted to do since I was 17. Um, it's been 11 years at Simon & Schuster and yeah, I got the founder of Science Fiction Imprint. How that cool is happen. that? Yeah, it doesn't happen. Really so um, I'm very appreciative of it. But yeah, I, I granted my way in. <laughs> that was awesome. a great answer. That was a great answer. I loved it. And I miss B. Dalton too. So that's where you actually, you started way back when B. Dalton and then moved all the way. Store 321. 321. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you for sharing. Uh, Deanna, let's let's go to you and hear, hear your story real quick. So I got my first job in publishing more than 30 years ago, straight after finishing my master's. Uh, I was working for Parker Brace College Publishers. And I did that for three years. And science fiction and fantasy had always been what I truly loved. I mean, that that was what I read. I I it was it was what I had read since I was, you know, eleven or twelve years old. So after about three years of doing college textbooks, I started looking up all of the publishers um, who did my favorite books. And I started cold calling around at the publishing companies and saying, hey, who hires your copy editors? Can I have a copy editing test? And I got into, I got into freelancing. I stayed at Harcourt for about another year and then I left and have been freelancing ever since. I I love what I do. So I love it. I love that you you reached out and asked. Basically, I mean, you said, "How could I get into this?" And everything from you said when you were doing textbooks. Was there any specific yes. genre, or were they all all over the place, like science and and? I, it was mostly liberal arts textbooks. Okay. I worked. Yeah. Cool. So I did a lot of psychology and languages and various other things. Do you ever All miss that which... part of it? No. No. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but that all no, comes I in handy really... when you're copy editing speculative oh, fiction, yeah. I'm sure. Yes, I bet. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, thank you. Um, Ellen, uh, let's jump over to you. Um, well, I always was interested in reading science fiction, fantasy, and horror, but I figured I would should go try to get into publishing and I looked at the phone book, the yellow page. I wanted to, I didn't know, I would call, I basically sent my resume to every magazine and book publisher in the yellow pages when they were yellow pages for people who, for you <laughs> new people, younger people, you probably don't even know what the yellow pages are. When B. But Dalton was around. But I didn't want to yeah. get into science fiction. <laughs> I didn't want to be pigeonholed. So I was actually in mainstream 
I worked in mainstream publishers for about five years. And as I say, getting nowhere slowly. Um, I worked for my first job at Little Brown, Holt Reinhardt and Winston, Crown, McDavid McKay, Charterhouse. Um, and then none of that worked out. But I, then I found out about this new magazine that was launching called Omni. And one of my a colleagues from Holt Reinhardt Winston, I had quit. And he said, yeah, why don't you try this new magazine? They publish science fiction and, and, and science. So I basically went over, I basically begged them, you know, for like <laughs> to interview. And I met the editor, the overall editor. And then I met Ben Bova, who was a fiction editor at the time. And he didn't know me from a hole in the wall. I didn't know fandom existed. I didn't even know magazine, science fiction magazines existed. But um, <clears throat> I persuaded him to let me read this slush while he was away in, in England for a world con in 1979. And I said, I promised him I would finish reading the slush. It was then, you know, paper slush piles, unsolicited manuscripts. And I got back, I would get back a week from, from I was in California a week before he would get back from London or England, I said I could catch up and I did. First he said, no, no. And then he must've thought of how much he's gonna have to read because his secretary was not a reader. So she wasn't an assistant. Usually with fiction editors, you have an assistant who actually reads the unsolicited manuscripts. In any case, he came back, I read the slush. He told me, hang out. He must've known he was gonna be made into the fiction, uh, made into the editor that, and he brought in Barbara Sheckley and I was made associate fiction editor. And that's really how I started at Omni. Um, and actually basically nagging them to death and being in the right place at the right time. And then, so I was there for 17 years and uh, after Omni, Omni Online was killed, um, my former colleagues and I started um, Event Horizon for about a year and a half where we had um, fiction interviews, chats, um, a column by Lucia Shepard, just all kinds of various stuff. And we funded it ourselves, couldn't get advertising. This was back in 96. So there was no such thing as no one knew anything about advertising online. And then I got hired by um, sci-fi.com to create sci-fiction for six years. And that was in 2006, I guess. And I've been freelancing ever since. I've been working for um, for tour.com. You know, as I said, I acquire and I, and I also put together, I've been doing anthologies since around the late, 80s, I started editing anthologies, mostly okay. specializing in horror. So I didn't, at the time, to not conflict with conflict with my regular job, which was at Omni. And and Christmas and other horrors was the one that I that stood out to me when I read your bio uh, out loud because I thought there was, was a lot of horror that, involved, and then Christmas got. <laughs> well, I was afraid my publisher would hate it. I thought it was a perfect title, but I thought some people might be offended by it. And I was actually really surprised that my pub, my edit, in-house editor said, it's a great idea. I hate Christmas. <laughs> you know, like, Everybody secretly understand. hates it. And no one objected. I never there, haven't gotten there's a whole questions. Yeah, now there's like there are a whole subgenre of Christmas horror films and stuff. So, yeah, that's uh, very cool. Um, I, I From all three of you, I think I think the takeaway probably for our audience is that it was not a well, I graduated college or and then I became an editor, <laughs> right? It's, 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 no, there's, it's, there's a lot you there's a lot of different. You got to kind of work with what you have and, and move in, in the direction that you you um, are, are given and the opportunities that arise and everything and, and kind of just, um, you know. You end up in a way uh, in, in, in a space that's that's in all of yours, very different than where you began. But uh, like Paul said with uh, Deanna and the and, uh, uh, textbooks and everything, although you, you don't miss it anymore, obviously right. really valuable for the freelance right. editing and, and, and copy editing and everything like that. So good takeaway for folks in the audience and stuff who, who, who have thought about, you know, I want to be an editor or a copy editor and stuff is that like, you know, take any opportunity that you can, it sounds like, yeah. and, and kind of go with it. Sure. Yeah. Joe, you mentioned just a, just a minute ago that things are different now. So how how are they different with this with the type of career trajectory that that each of you have have just shared with us be possible today? And if not, what are the more likely trajectories for someone trying to break in? I mean, mine was a little weird because of being at Barnes Noble and being a buyer. And this one, Barnes Noble was at ascendancy and was at least forty percent of the market share at worst. So I knew a lot of folks in publishing because of that, but. Uh, take that element out of it. 
my last the my my current assistant um uh went to a, went went to a procedure school went to a, to a, a publishing program afterwards so just sort of like a, a mini kind of grad school uh and then from there you get connections and then she was actually a scout for a year and a half so she's overqualified but this is what she always wanted to do and has been waiting selectively to apply to certain positions editorially until she got the right one and um that's how we got together uh caroline uh too but um and a previous assistant too. That's a, went to undergrad and went to a publishing program, as sort of grad school, and then that, and then made connections that way, and then got into publishing. So you're looking at a six-year degree in order to get an editorial assistant position, you know, and it's hard. It's hard. Yeah. And Four hundred people applied, you know. Wow. Um, yeah. So it's it's not easy. It's not easy. But I mean, but there are, at the same time, there are there are there are like more. Um, uh, like small press opportunities, right? For for an editorial career, even though you might you might not be able to make that your sole source of income, you can still be exercising that that desire to to you know be involved yeah, in the that, game. Yeah, the practical experience goes a long way. I mean, you know, the reason why Caroline stood out was because of her experience doing another job that was related, right? right. Um, but yeah, I mean, if you can find uh, opportunities again, whether it's internships or whatnot uh absolutely take them um because that counts more than the academic more than, experience more than the academic right yeah yeah the publishing programs and whatnot i mean it's it's about connections and networking which is i'm sure we can all agree is so much of publishing um yeah. ellen if you've ever heard of the malcolm gladwell connector type of person uh, you've, you're looking at one of them right now. Ellen Datlin knows everybody. Uh, I just emailed her today asking for like an email and someone like, I'm looking for someone's email. And like, I, I can't find it. And of course, 10 minutes later, I get, I get a response. Um, so that's Ellen. Well, I mean, short fiction is very different in getting into, I mean, it's, it's always been difficult. Um, and I think it still is, but there's so many people starting new magazines. I think the best way to get into, if someone wants, it's really hard to make a living out of, out of writing short fiction and out of editing it too, even. Um, I mean, there aren't that many magazines that pay their editors or the publishers, you know, like FNSF, the Dell magazines, the four Dell magazines, the Ellery Queen, Alfred Hitchcock, Analog and Asimov's. And most of the others are started by people who are, scrambling to make a living out of it like neil clark you know and and the thomases i mean it's very hard and the thing is to the way to, the way to get into anything is try to learn to read slush whether it's novels or short stories if you can get a job or an internship the problem is a lot of places don't pay you to do that mm -hmm. um but reading uh, i don't know if everyone knows what slush means it just means stories that or novels that come in unsolicited not agented Short fiction is rarely agented. Novels usually are. Um, but if you can get it, I mean, I don't know how many people here are interested in short in magazine work, you know, but that is a whole different thing from publishing, but it's still connections. You know, you contact anyone you ever heard of. One thing I learned very early when I made a, a terrible, stupid mistake was that if someone, you know, if a book editor or major editor or publisher or anybody says, I, you know, and you apply for a job and no, there's no job, but I can talk, but would you like to come and talk to me? And I stupidly, this was in the seventies said, no, it's like, well, you don't have a job. Why should I meet you? When you know, like, no, you always say yes. <laughs> if yeah. anyone professional offers to have a drink with you, coffee with you, just talk with you in their office, say yes. No, because, you know, they may know some other job available and they'll give you insight into the whole publishing industry. It goes back to the connections and networking aspect of the whole thing. Yeah, yeah. Um, it helps if you're gregarious. If you're very shy, it's kind of tough, I think. It's tougher. You know, I mean, I, I, yourself out. I know not everybody here is a is, you know, a speculative fiction writer. Um, I mean, it, in our audience, but speculative fiction writers, romance writers, there's a whole, you know, culture out there of conventions and conferences. And that's the way, that's one way that you can begin this kind of networking process that we're talking about. And, you know, you can go up and meet Ellen. You can go say hi to Joe and buy him buy him a drink. And you can say hi to Deanna. 
um, and begin, you know, the relationship. Like Deanna has sent me a lot of freelance copy work, editing work over the years. Ellen, I don't know, I don't know if you remember this, but I'm pretty darn sure that I read Slush for you way back in the day. In Omni for Omni? Yeah, I think I did. I don't remember. I think you, I think you handed me handed me a few piles uh, at one one point when desperation was was really uh, was was rampant. But um, <laughs> just to, just to say that you know these are valuable connections that will pay off in ways that you can't uh, really yeah. predict. Mm -hmm. Um, so it's not all just about the editorial job. I'm sorry to cut you off, Paul. You know, yeah. we're no, talking no, no, about no, that please. as the as the little pinhole funnel. But there's so many other jobs in publishing that also provide creative output and uh, fulfillment. You know, and uh, Deanne is one of them. You know, <laughs> well, and and uh, yeah, with the, and the, so let's talk a little bit about like distinguishing the different four types of editors that we have here, because we have Ellen, who's who's like primarily known for magazine fiction, editing short fiction, editing anthologies, acquiring for tour, short fiction for the website, and so on and so it's forth. It's Reactor, you know. It's called Yes, Reactor. exactly. Sorry, right, Reactor. And, <laughs> uh, and, uh, and, and Joe, you're doing more like novel length works, which is, which is you know, kind of a, a, a different kettle of fish. And Deanna, you're copy editing mostly novels, I think. Yeah. Um, but so can you can each of you talk a little bit about like what is the difference between the types of editing that you do and maybe Deanna you can start with copy editing. Sure well. What. What Ellen and Joe do is very much more big picture type work and what a copy editor do does is very extraordinarily detail oriented. A lot of people have the impression that copy editing is nothing but um, correcting grammar and correcting spelling, and that could not be farther from the truth. Those things are important, but it's so critical when you're copy editing to pay attention to all of the little details, to look for plot holes, to compare the timeline to make sure that everything's adding point. up. Yeah, <laughs> to, you know, did they mention a full moon in, you know, chapter two and then how many days have gone by and what, what's, what phase is the moon at now? You have to pay yeah, very close. Minutes. Yeah, you have to pay very close attention to all of those little things, you know? And then th there are things like, you know, a character had green eyes in chapter three and then all of a sudden they have blue eyes in chapter 18 or or authors are always authors are sometimes very bad about killing off some minor character and oh, right. kind of forgetting <laughs> like the character walks through a scene later on so you just have to be very aware of of all these tiny little things yes, my, my favorite was uh I mean, the main character was naked for like half the book, the first draft. <laughs> oh, so yeah. they, they came out of the ocean. Uh, if I'm revealing too much of the plot, so you know who the author was. They came out of the ocean naked uh, and, uh, Never and just stayed that way. Yeah, on. there was no yeah. mention. Right? There was the mention that they were naked in the water and then never got dressed. <laughs> yeah. It wasn't. Yeah. <laughs> Well, well, I can, um, to me, it's two, oh, yeah. two different parts. I mean, the acquisitions and the actual editing. And it's different for websites that I uh, acquire for and my anthologies, but I'll just talk about the websites and working like Fatura.com, Reactor and the novellas and Nightfire. Um, people will send me stories. I will say, I will reject them if I don't reject them, if I want them, if I like them, if I like them enough, but they may not be, um, good enough for me to buy immediately but i think i'll i can get the author to fix it i will work with the author on several drafts to get them to, to fix it um i will ask them a lot of questions i mean this is for novellas too i acquire novellas for um tour.com and at that point if it's if it's a clean clean enough copy in other words it doesn't need too much work i will pass it on the short stories i just buy 
<clears throat> and when I do that, I mean, I don't do, a, I actually do a final line edit, which is line by line edit, which is, um, I will do like three months before the story has to go into production for everything else, which means copy editing. It does, unfortunately, our tour.com does not um, proofread our short stories. So the copy editor is, we have a fantastic, I have a fantastic copy editor whenever, you know, I asked, I said, please let, send me her. She's the best. She's very picky. And that's great because, um, you know, there are things she may pick at that are, I don't agree with. I will go over a copy edit of the story first before sending it on to the author. I will go over the copy edit to see, yes, step that, uh, rather leave that as is, or uh, yes, I agree with the copy editor. And then it goes to the copy editor. Basically, the copy editor is our safety net because if the author and I hopefully will catch all these things, all these problems with the continuity or, or the color of the eyes, you know, or things like that. But we miss things and you know, repetition of words, repetition of phrases. I mean, to me, that's my my job to fix that or to catch it. But if I don't, I sure depend on the copy editor to do that. So it's both acquisitions plus the actual substantive editing, working with the author back and forth, back and forth. Yeah. Um, the, to make what Deanna was saying about like big picture is true and the, what Ellen is saying about the mitigation between like what you rely on the copy editor for and what we end up doing. Um, there's a certain part of me when like, I'm going over a major, uh, you know, the, the overview of the manuscript and what the character motivations are doing and what's the overall plot and what are you trying to do with this and that and the dialogue with the author and all those uh, parts of the overall editing. And sure, you know, you catch a typo here, this, that, that doesn't make sense and more clarity in this sentence, that sort of conversation. But, uh, there are absolutely parts of the manuscript that I don't touch because I know the copy editor is going to come to it. You know, <laughs> and my job is really the bigger picture and getting this all together. Or yeah. to speak of a uh, writer that Ellen and I both work with, with Stephen Graham Jones. Um, mm -hmm. Stephen's notes, uh, especially in copy edits, are uh, He's hilarious. a handful. Yeah, he'll yeah. argue with you. I mean, he won't even argue. He'll say, "Well, this is why I did that, that, and that." And I'm thinking, I don't care. Just fix it. Right, yeah, but he gets, he gets into dialogue in his notes. So like, what about this? But also his dialogue is different. I have to interpret it. Even, yes, wait, wait, wait. Even he has different it. voices. I mean, he writes novels, novellas, and short stories. Every story, every novel, well, not every novel, but a lot of his work have different voices. And sometimes I have to ask if he's, if it's a vernacular thing. If he has a sentence that may, to me, in my ear, sounds wrong. But if he does it more than once, like three or four times, I'm usually thinking he's doing it on purpose. But my job is to ask him if he's doing that on purpose. And right. if not, fix it. If so, OK. Well, I, mean, I think I it's funny. Get that with him too. Right, Joe? Uh, so many authors think that they are um, answering the copy editor when they're looking over the manuscripts. And I mean, I don't I don't see any of their right. answers ever, ever, I think. Mm -hmm. um, I'll have an author say, oh, I, I wrote you back all this stuff. And I'm like, well, I, I don't well, think that's nice. If someone says something nice about the copy, it'll believe me, I tell you, I tell them. Oh, yeah, yeah. You know, oh, no, they, like, they definitely do that. Yes. Yeah, same. But yeah, it's it's a dialogue. And usually the dialogue ends up coming back to the editor, you know. Um, yeah. uh, uh, but there are other facets. There are also managing editors who are not just project managers, but are also looking over and proofreading as well. You know, um, it's probably four to five people looking at a manuscript every time it goes out. And yes, and when a typo ends up in the manuscript, you get really pissed off. I mean, Neil Gaiman has this 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 thing he does where like he opens up a book that just came in, that just got published, and he finds a typo on the first page. And it's, it, it happens, you know, you, you get 100,000 words, you miss them a couple of times, but uh, generally we get most of it. Yeah. Well, hopefully not on the first page, though. Yes, no. yes. The Atlas of Hell by Nathan Valley when my mom caught a typo in the first page of the book, in my first, in the first printing of it, in one of my anthologies, I have no idea if it's been fixed ever since, but it drove, it like, no, no. Yeah. <laughs> so we're going to try to pull some questions out of the chat because the chat is just going crazy. Yeah. And, and <laughs> um, so, um, let me see, how, how, <laughs> 
We'll start with an easy one. How fast do you need to be able to edit? Because it feels like editors are really fast. Like for for and and again, each of you is editing in a different a different mode, right? So the lengths of time are probably different as well. I would imagine. It depends I, on the length. It depends on so many things. Um, I will say that hardly um, only in my entire forty or more years of editing. I've only think I published two stories that needed no editing whatsoever. And who were they by? One was by um, Kelly Eskridge. And we changed the title, but it, nothing else needed to be fixed. I mean, it was just perfect. And maybe that was the only one I can't remember. There might have been one other, but it depends on how clean that is, how much work or non-work you have to do in the manuscript, um, and how long the story is, if it's a novella, if it's a novel. So it, it totally depends. And also how complex. I mean, I have one writer, uh, Kathleen Jennings, whose work is extremely complex, which means I have to really focus. I can't like be distracted by other things. If I'm when I'm working on her novella, um, I just have to be really focused so I don't miss anything. And so I can question her about issues. So it can take I don't even I don't even have time. It. I mean, I don't know. <laughs> I don't think of it that way. What about you, Jim? Right. Well, the end is the opposite. I mean, well, yeah, yeah, you've been paid by the hour, right? Yeah, <laughs> but, and you're expected to do more and more. I mean, when I was first starting out in copy editing, pretty much the, the standard was that you were expected to edit um, about, you know, 2,500 words per hour, say 10, 10 manuscript pages an hour, right? And any more uh, companies are expecting more and more and more copy editing quickly. I, I know there is one publisher that wants 17 pages an hour done. Wow. And as a copy editor, I mean, I read, I read every manuscript at least twice. And I read sections of it more than that, because if I don't read it at least twice, I will miss some of the plot holes. Plus, so, you have to be looking stuff up, right? You have to go you're out. Looking you have to stuff up. You're fact checking. You're going back and forth. You're doing a lot of stuff. So 17 pages an hour, just it, it doesn't work for me. I end up not taking very many projects for the companies that want me to do that. Joe, how fast do you edit? Uh, I keep it all in my head as I go along. It's terrible. So I'm a slow reader, but it's because of that. I I read and adjust and keep it all going in my head at the same time. And then I come back. Oh, we talked about that on that page 40, but we're now on page 86. So then I go back don't to page 40 to see if it. Don't you take notes when you do that? A little bit, but it's all in my head, Ellen. It's terrible. Um, I know. I know. I know. It's I take work. notes. I have pages of notes. A page. Well, I you make know, little comments on the side throughout the manuscript, but like, yeah, I keep it all in my head and then keep going and then there's a flow oh. that happens. It's very much a bell curve and maybe 15, 20 pages the first hour. And then by like hour, hour two to hour three, I'm, I'm going to 40, 60 pages, but like um, an hour, but uh, it depends on the book, you know, uh, as a converse to your story about like not editing things, uh, I almost have done no editing on Ken Liu's quartet of fantasy novels and if you're not familiar with these things um the last two were 367,000 words we uh, it was split into two uh, it was it was came in as one 367,000 word manuscript that one I, we cut the ends off in beginnings but other than that um I didn't edit almost anything in that and yet it took me two months because I was reading it and making sure that it all fit and everything fit perfectly but but Ken's a rare genius where it it does and he's worked it all meticulously and one of the reasons why we work well together is that i know he knows that i trust him and i get him and this is a lot of like kind of the, like the creative part of it that's not you can't really uh talk about it other than in these terms that like i get your voice like when you were talking about steven like he's using this vernacular to me it's just like yeah that's him and I get his voice and it just works. But he works. doesn't use it all the time. That's the uh, but he uses different ones, but I get it because he's, that's the flow he's going with. <laughs> you have to so, figure out which one he's using. Yeah, so, um, you know, if it doesn't work for everyone, right? And so this is this is the creative aspect of it that I love. Um, and then, you know, the copy editors come in and like, well, Mary Webster's 11, which is the standard for Simon Schuster. That is not a proper phrase. <laughs> and, 
you know, uh, I got to work with Ursula Quinn. It was one of my favorite copy edit stories. Uh, and this wasn't you, Deanna. So <laughs> uh, she passed away right before the copy edits for her introduction to the big omnibus illustrated edition of Earthsea was getting published. And she wrote the introduction, copy edits were coming back, and um, she couldn't do them, so I did, I did them. And I swear I heard her voice in my head. Mm. Ursula had a idiosyncratic use of commas um, throughout her career. And she also tried to write in verse, even for like an introduction, uh, she would write in verse. And so there was, because uh, she was a big fan of Tolstoy and Tolkien, and, and then, you know, they always wrote, they tried in verse as well. It was there, it was there. And so it was just step all the way. <laughs> the improper use of commas because that's what she was doing that's what she always did and that's the art yeah right? i mean if you're um, lucky when you're very lucky you get a, a good copy editor like diana who doesn't try to impose their voice they understand the voice of the writer yeah i mean yeah. they still call it out but like yeah. well they can question certain things and that's fine you know i have a problem is that when i start something i when i start the line edit i usually am very assiduous i the first few pages, I like have a lot of notes. Oh, as I as I edit, I notes notes all the time. Usually, yeah, Ellen, Ellen, can that. you? I'm sorry. Can you can you explain what line editing is? Uh, line editing is line by line editing. Okay. <laughs> it's reading the story. No, seriously, it's reading the story, and you go over, you read it line by line, and if there's, then you, and then you just pick up differences. If if someone's repeating a word in three lines down, I note that. If um, if I find something wrong with the line, if I find that um, I don't understand what what the author is saying in that one or two sentences, I will question. I don't understand what you mean, or do you mean a different word? Well, rewrite this because it doesn't make sense, or explain it to me. What I actually do a lot of is ask questions. I said, right. you know, sometimes the writer um, they think they have it on the page, but they don't. Right. Um, you know that habit. Kelly Robeson wrote an incredible story, um, A Human Stain that the third go around, this was the third, this was not a line edit, this was the third go around back and forth. When I asked certain questions and it turned out that I totally misunderstood what was going on because it wasn't on the page. You know, when she told me, this is what's happening, I said, what? <laughs> so, you know, sometimes the author has, the story has to be brought out. That's more than line editing, though. I mean, but the line editing process is the last thing I do before I hand it to production. And that is a line, but hopefully by that point, the story is pretty clean. But the line by line thing, and the problem with that is like the first few pages, I'll be focused, focused, focused. But every time I do, I read a story that I love, I get involved in the story again. It's harder for me to line edit it because I forget, you know, I, I just forget because I love the story. I'm involved in the reading the story again. So, I mean, does that does, does that explain what line editing is though? I mean, enough. I mean, yeah. I'm not yeah. sure what else to mm -hmm. say about what it is, but it's a no, different absolutely. process. It's the, it's the last thing I do before handing the, the, whatever the material is to production for copy edit. What would you call the kind of editing that you do prior to that? Because a lot of, I, I like, a, you know, I, I call it like developmental you, editing. Yeah. I'm sorry, what do you call it? Developmental. I call it substantive. Substantive, I'm, okay. I mean, that's just what I, call I think. Developmental it. is more of a British term, but yeah. yeah. I, or more academic too, I think. Is but it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think so. Yeah. yeah. So, so yeah, let's, I just call it substantive editing. Let's, uh, Jacob. Do you want to pull in another question out of the chat? Yeah, there's one. Um, you know, we were hearing where you're all located, and I believe I know that Ellen and Joe. I believe you're in New York. Deanna, are you also in New York? I'm no, I'm in State You're College, Jersey. Pennsylvania. Okay. Uh, a lot of folks on the call are are in rural America, um, and, and and so they're kind of curious about like how they can, you know, be a part of this process. Or yeah. is is there something? Is it one of those things where, you know, like the movie star, you got to move to California to get involved with this? Or are there opportunities? Used to be. For for, yeah. for yeah. editing okay. specifically or for writing? I mean, for, for writing. editing, for yeah. editing. I mean, you can write anywhere, I know, but yeah. <laughs> as we know, but uh, yeah, for yeah. editing yeah. services. Yeah, I have I one think... One of my editors lives in L.A. Another one uh, is also remote, but she lives outside of New York City, but just outside of she can commute in. Uh, she doesn't want to, and I, I th that's fine. Um, uh, there's more opportunities now than there were before. The problem with not living where the publisher is, if it's a book publisher, is that you don't see 
unless you have regular Zoom meetings, especially now. I mean, before that, it's good for the whole company, the, all, the, all the different elements of whoever makes the book get together and meet. And it used to be it had to be in the office. Now it doesn't with Zoom and, and other you know, apps, which is great. So I think it's changed, but still, I mean, usually don't publishers maybe want their employees to come in like every once in a while to the office, maybe. <laughs> Depends on the publisher, right? I mean, yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, it's, I, I come in two, at least two times a week. Um, yeah, I think it's less crucial, but still to make the connections, it's hard. For genre, as Joe pointed out, there are conventions and there are conventions all over the world. And if you, and a lot of editors and, and all different publishers go to many of those conventions. And at those conventions, you can meet people. And yes, you can probably work remotely more so than in the past. In the past, New York was it. Um, but now there are other places where they have small publishers and just all around the country. Yeah, in the right. world. Yeah. I think then there are a lot of questions in similar vein in, in the chat about internships and everything, too. And I think kind of in that same light, since I mean, the Internet has kind of made the world a little bit smaller where I, maybe internships can be done over the Internet versus having to be in that actual place where the uh, mm -hmm. publishing house is and stuff as well. So. Um, yeah, for, so for those who are living in rural America, do not lose hope. There are a lot of opportunities. It's just that you you need to um, hunt them out. And and as um, suggested earlier as well, it's it's a, a lot of it is networking. Look up those conventions or the conferences and stuff that are available. I, AWP is one of the largest ones uh, that you can uh, that you can go to as well and 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 network and talk to folks and stuff. I know there is one question out there because I mean. Some writers are very uh, shy or introverted and stuff. But one question that has gotten a lot of likes in the chat is, how do you network if you're so darn shy or that you don't that that you're a little nervous to approach someone and stuff like, you know, if they see one of you three at a conference, I mean, what what is your advice for approaching you? <laughs> if you met us here, if you've met us virtually or not, come over and say, I was in this chat. I saw you talking. And that's an opener, you know, that right yeah, there. Absolutely. And I think, I mean, I tend toward the shy side myself, but when I'm at a convention, I know that I have something in common with everyone there. And that makes it so much easier to go and to talk to people and say, oh, hey, um, you know. Yeah, the other thing I'll say is that like, you know, we've, we've all three of us been around a little while. And so we have, <clears throat> we have friends, like Alan and I know each other very well. Right. And, we might be together at a convention and we might be having a couple other people there with us and we're all like talking and you think, oh, they're all talking. It's like, no, it's okay. Like, you know, I've yeah. done that for decades. Don't worry. You can interrupt us. I'll see you later. <laughs> you know, it's fine. You know, don't just come up and like say, hey, I mean, when it comes to you know, I mean, well, yeah, know, but you know, but still, like, don't feel like, oh, no, they're talking. Yeah, you can, <laughs> well, you can certainly say, if people are sitting around in a bar drinking, you can, well, not drinking liquor, but just sitting around. Usually at a convention, you can just pull up a chair or say, if it's not business, you know, if it looks like a social gathering, you can always say, hey, may I join you? Um, yeah. It's actually for conventions, I actually advise you to go with somebody, a friend. It's hot for the first time. If you've never been to a convention before, it's much easier if you're with somebody, I think. Because then the both of you can mm -hmm. be more comfortable. Let me kind of switch switch things up just a little bit because we've been talking uh, about like what an editor's job and a copy editor's job entails and and how uh, the our attendees tonight might um, find their way into that kind of a position. But there, everybody here is also, uh, or many of the people in the audience tonight are also aspiring writers. Um, and the editorial relationships that they that they uh, will experience will will be uh, super important in their careers and in their personal lives because you know the, the personal relationships between editors and copy editors and their writers can be very intense. Um, so what what can you tell aspiring writers about like how 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 should they how should they relate to their to their editors? Um, I mean. What is this relationship like from that from that side? You go first, Joe. Oh, nice. <laughs> uh, adversarial all the way. Um, no. He's no. kidding. He's kidding. Uh, not at all. You know, I mean, look, we got into this like it, we've we've 
chosen to read your book or work with you on this book or story because we like it. And if we, the way I edit, and I'm sure it's the way you edit in the larger sense too, Ellen, uh, we're both trying to figure out what the story is that you're trying to tell and help you tell it the best way you can. And so if we ask questions, we ask you, yeah, you want to change this or that, it's because we have a perspective that may be um, helpful to you. And even if you don't agree with the perspective, it still means like there's something to look at and examine, you know, and, and kind of work through it that way. So um, you should disagree, you know, and that's fine. I I, I get disagreed with all the time and I, I love it uh, because what it does, it, it sparks. Part of the process you're in. Yeah. I mean, right. if you it's... haven't bought something, if something on submission, that's different than if you're committed to buying something. All right. So sure. if something's on submission and you really like it, then if it's a new writer, I try to be a lot more gentle than with my regular authors. <laughs> when my writers, I say, why are you doing this? It's like, this sucks, <laughs> or whatever. I mean, I'll be more straightforward. But with a new writer, if it's submitted to me and I like it, um, and I'll, if I think that I, if you're, if I think you're experienced enough that you can understand my suggestions and you don't have to take them, but at least as Joe says, um, and you, if I think I can work with you to make your story better and then buy it, I will do that. I don't have that much time. If I don't think I'm going to buy it anyway, I probably won't work with you on the story. But, you know, that's a process, too. Um, if I'm committed to buying, it means I like it a lot. But I will not, if it's something, ma if I think there's something really major wrong with it, I will not commit to buying a story until I and the writer can agree that we can fix it if it needs fixing. You know, so I don't even go that far. But you commission books, right? What happens if something doesn't work out, <laughs> Joe? I mean, you know, it's it hasn't bitten me in the butt, really. I mean, I, I you know, usually I had, experience, I had the experience at tour where I commission we commissioned a novella, and the writer wrote you know, the proposal very detailed, and it came in. I read it, and I realized. Um, the, the novellas are, are treated like books. They, you know, a committee looks at them and accepts them and we turned it down. And it was, um, I understand, I know why we did it turned out, even though she did what she said she was going to do, it didn't work. And um, she didn't have to pay the money back. I mean, we paid her and I got paid for my editing, but that happens once in a while. If you commission something that's not finished yet, it's like on proposal. And you take it, more book publishers do that. Short story editors don't do that much, really. I may solicit stories for an anthology, but I do never uh, commit to buying one unless I see it first. I mean, uh, it's a, the question of what you're coming to, it's just the difference between commissioning a book and, and acquiring it. And so usually manuscripts are fully complete when we buy them. Uh, sometimes they're partials. And partials are always difficult because you don't know what you're going to get. But you, sometimes if it's a more experienced author, you know what their writing is like, you like them or not, you trust them to a certain degree, that kind of thing. And if it's a debut author and it's a partial... <laughs> it could go see, south. have I bought a partial from a debut <laughs> author? I think no. <laughs> Did you? Have you done it or have you no, turned I have, it down? I think I have, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's rough. I mean, it's yeah. tough. Because you're afraid you don't know what you're going to get. Yeah. And so, or like, it, it, or I should phrase it this way. I might have, I no, I definitely have made offers on things, but it had been outbidded uh, because I thought it wasn't worth it because you don't know what you're going to get. Um, and then but, you find out you made the right, you lucky, you're yeah. happy. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've never been unhappy about it, those kind of choices. So. Mm. I had a quick question too, because I mean, like we're also speaking from, you know, the publishing houses and stuff on this call, and I know that a lot of our our students are really interested in the self publishing aspect sure. of of the trade as well. So they're like for those types of folks, like uh, how can they seek editorial assistance before publishing? And like, are there any tips that I know that you're from? you know, the publishing houses and stuff, but like any tips for seeking out editors in that role? Like, are there any traps that they should be aware of where editing services are promising something that is just they not something that a norm? An editing service that promises that they can make your book saleable is bogus, a scam. A aid, yes. Yeah. You know, they cannot guarantee that unless they're publishing it themselves. Um, 
But there are a lot of respectable people. Paul does freelance editing. There are a lot of people who do freelance editing. But I, I always worry with self-publishing. I mean, I know it's changed a lot, but I still think that unless you have an audience built in, it's much harder to get your book out there to people who want might want to read it. Sure. Um, but... And do you really want to spend all that time marketing it yourself and not writing the next book? Sometimes they you know, do. I know. I know they do. But I'm just saying <laughs> that's something they should think about before sure. someone self-publishes. Why don't you try to sell the book first? Why immediately self-publish? But there are legitimate, a lot of legitimate uh, authors, uh, editors who uh, used to work in publishing. Oh, even, you know. Yeah, I know yeah. plenty. I mean, I know right. several and I recommend them usually. And then yeah. you need somebody like Deanna. <laughs> well, yes, yeah. So so um, if you're if you're an, an author out there who's decided to to self-publish and you know we'll, we'll, we'll so we support that um here at here at snhu and in the online mfa and in the ma um so you're but but still you know you don't you know better than to just throw your book out there you want to get it edited you want to get it copy edited um how how do you then judge the um you, you know you're looking out there you're looking online how do you judge whether an editor who has their shingle out is uh, reputable, and how do you judge whether a copy editor who has their shingle out is reputable? And you and you when know someone you can trust with your book. I would I would ask people who I knew if I mean I I would try to get recommendations from people first. I'm not sure how someone who's just out of the field and doesn't know anything would do that. But I think mm -hmm. that's how I would go. Go ahead, Dean. We yeah. can ask what what they've done before. You right. know, what what all books have you copied or edited? You know, by whom? Things like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and someone else mentioned Reedsy in the chat, and uh, they they usually have. And you go through and you can see like for an editor at least, uh, but also I think for a copy editor. Um, well, the copy editor might be like whom they work with as far as companies or authors, but. Uh, People and for editors, they can say, like, oh, I did this book and that book and that book. And if you like those books, then, like, maybe there's something But there. also find out if yeah. a lot of copy editors and freelance editors um, started out in publishing. So find mm -hmm. a lot of them. I mean, right, um, that's, we do a like John this Douglas yeah. was a great freelance editor. He had been working for publishers for many years. So someone like that, you can look up his bio. I mean, it'll say who he was, uh, what he did at first. And then if you know they have a reputation, if they were a published with a publisher, a respectable publisher for many years and worked with certain authors, then presumably they can do a good job freelancing for you. Right. And Joe kind of raised a good point, too, about like reading, looking up like the editors are going to tell you what they've edited. They're, they're not going to hide, you know, what they've done, especially if it's gotten published and, and has, has made it big and everything. So looking along the lines of like what they have published and if it's something along what your writing is important to. I mean, I think that's something that it was drilled in when I was in the MFA, when you're submitting short stories to literary journals and stuff, it's like, look at who the editor of that literary journal is. Are they going to be interested in this particular type of writing? Because if they're not, now especially, you're wasting your $5 submitting it to that magazine because they're not going to they're not going to look at it because that's not something that they're interested in. So always do your research in that way too. See what is it that they're editing. Is it, don't... Don't go with that Google, the first Google search result. Do your research okay. and see. Try not to pay editor. Try not to pay publishers to look at your work. I mean, right. yeah. some, I mean, that's something to really avoid. I know some. It's I submittable guess some it has really. Is, it's <laughs> that's that. that's that's like a different thing in the genre world and the literary yes. world. That, yes. That's what I've yep. come to learn anyway. In the genre yeah. world, it's a big no-no. In the in the literary world, it's very commonly accepted. I think it's to try to keep the magazines afloat because yes. they're always very strict. I mean, they don't have much funding and they're they're at the whims of, you know, their their schools and stuff who also are questioning, do we want to fund this and stuff? So they ask right. for those five dollar submissions and stuff like that. But um, yeah, that definitely different in, in terms of genre versus literary, of course, as well. Well, Paul, should we ask the AI question? There's been a few yes, questions let's, about it. Let's let's do ask the AI question. Why don't you go ahead sure. and phrase 
and, and Phrase, go, oh, well, I'm, are you guys afraid of AI and, yeah, and, I mean, and what it's going to and, do? Well, I guess. And, do you, and not just AI as it's applied to like, you know, getting right. stories like coming coming in that are written by AI. But do you see like a, a, a potential use anywhere down the road uh, for AI to assist in editing work or copy editing work? Like what is its what is its place? In I would like editing? to get Deanna to go first. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. So I, I have no, I have no uh, concern whatsoever about AI taking my job as a copy editor. What I okay. have concern about yeah. is that if it does become more and more accepted for this AI junk to actually get published, it is going to completely change what copy editors do because the copy editor is going to have to go back and do even more fact checking and tons of rewriting and like because it's crap right now. Yeah. It's, it's yeah. just crap. I mean, what a copy editor is going to have to do to something written by AI is not remotely the same thing that they have to do to something that is written by an actual person. I mean, in order to make it into. You'd have to rewrite real. it. You do right. have to, you would, you would have yeah. to rewrite it. It's so, like I mean, translations. It, you need someone who can actually rewrite the words. You, you really would. Them. You would really have to have somebody rewrite the AI written stuff mm -hmm. because it is obvious that it is AI written. And sure, it'll get better, but it's not going to get leaps. And I, I'm highly skeptical that it will get leaps and bounds better than that you won't be able to tell that it's AI yeah. because I'm, of the particular yeah. kinds of mistakes that get made. I can't imagine, well, I can't imagine getting stories by AI that I'd find interesting. Mm -hmm. No. Now, maybe I'm wrong, but I can't imagine that it would have the imagination to create a story I'd like, actually. Yeah. Maybe, that I maybe flash like, fiction, oh. but like. Huh? Yeah, no. Yeah. But like, look, we tried some experiments with generative AI at work just for fun, you know, to see if we could write copy. You, know, you put the book in, see if it comes out, and it was generally so bad that we always had to rewrite it. Uh, and it took longer to do the rewrite of the AI copy than it would have if we just generated it ourselves. And this was like lots yeah. of folks didn't try it. Like, it's just yeah. not worth it. And you know, uh, I'm I, I'm not a lot. I, I'm an ex hacker. That's you know, I'm, I'm totally into right. this. I'm like, no. <laughs> Well, that I, you, don't think, you don't think that um, writing copy could improve an AI could, I mean, that an AI in the future could write copy okay? I think it'll get better. I, I think it will definitely get better. But I'm just going like to edit it, copy, you may not have to rewrite so. it. It'll be the generic copy that's like regurgitating a plot, you know. It's, it's not well, going to be the kind that of... all the time. I see that all the time. I know, but like it's not get, good copy. Every publicist, every publicist <laughs> who sends me, you know, who wants me to look at their books, but they all sound like the same. Well, maybe <laughs> they're all like, using right, AI, AI for, for, their, for their copy. It might as, or as well be an AI. I hate yeah. to say so, that. Would you suggest then for for our audience to not even just not even use AI at all? Like, I mean, even for query letters, say, hey, help me not not to use it as like, here, write this query letter for me. Awesome. That's perfect. I'm going to send that out. But hey, can you help me kind of draft this idea of a query letter? Then look at it through the lens of the writer and say, yeah, here's you know, it's a, it's a good start. But now I can edit it myself being the writer and everything, even that is kind of risky, you would say, or? I yes. don't get query letter. I mean, yeah. a query letter that's two lines saying, hey, here's my here's my story, read it. It's not a query letter. Now, when someone's writing a proposal for Joe or for me for a novella, that would be, I guess, a query letter. And believe me, I, I don't think a AI would do a very good job of interesting me in the plot or in the, you know, in the story or the storytelling. You know, it wouldn't show me mm -hmm. how the writer writes. Right. So you heard it, folks. Do not use AI right <laughs> uh, now. I know, that's one thing I'm not worried about. Plenty yes. of other things, but not, not that. Yet. Not yet. Yeah. Well, we are we are actually coming to the end of our hour. This has been like an incredible uh, journey, and I want to thank um, our guests so much, uh, Ellen, Deanna, and Joe. This has been wonderful. I wish we could go for another hour. Uh, I'm so sorry that we didn't get uh, to all of the questions um, in the chat. Uh, 
we were just uh, carried away with a wonderful conversation. Um, I would love we can do, a, we can do a hot lightning round. <laughs> Is there anything else that was big? I'm going to just yeah. drop something in the chat here. Um, okay. This is a survey that we would love it if uh, you felt like you had a moment to spare to help us get feedback on um, word for word so that we can continue to improve this in the future. Um, the AIs will make it better. <laughs> there you go, yeah. Helen. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, please don't use AI to answer the survey. <laughs> So for our next word for word, which is coming up on April 17th, and will feature best-selling and award-winning writer Kelly Link, who will read from and discuss her new novel, The Book of Love, which I just finished. It's pretty incredible. Oh, good. Um, I didn't get I bought it. I didn't get a chance to read it yet. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, I, I had I have to read it so that I can ask intelligent questions next month. So <laughs> um we hope everyone will come back and join us then. And uh with that, I wish everyone uh good night. And thank Thanks you again everyone. to good everyone. Night. Good night. All right. Take, Take care. care. Bye.